Uh, we have here another photographer who specializes in underwater photography as well, and that is Umid Mistri. And Umid uh, is a very uh, charming person with uh, multiple interests, I should say. Uh, one, he is a dive in instructor, and uh, he's a person who dives uh, deep, and uh, that is why he is associated. I came across uh, him, and I met him, in fact, uh, because uh, we had a project by Dipani where the hydrophone was installed to record the sound of whales uh, in Trivandrum coast and uh, it was actually Umid who has helped along with uh, another guy, uh, his friend from uh, Pondicherry helped in installing the device here and then he was, uh, he's a very good uh, underwater photographer as you see from his uh, website called Earth Collab and uh, then also uh, he's a cameraman, he's a writer, educator and what he does is basically uh, uh, shoot all these uh, uh, pictures and videos and then uh, use this as a medium to communicate as well. And that's why he's uh, more popular. And uh, in, in normally when you speak to him, he will not speak too, too much. But, you know, his uh, speak, pictures actually speak quite a lot. And uh, then he also uh, take photography, fashion, including fashion photography. And, uh, uh, and, and he has a multidisciplinary approach, primarily in creating awareness about the habitats. And we also used in our uh, book and uh, other publications, including the Jellyfish Conference, which is coming up, uh, his wonderful underwater photographs. And, uh, what, uh, and uh, he's back from uh, Germany now, and then he's uh, uh, sharing his experiences through the photographs. And uh, uh, basically, you know, this is a way in which you can combine. When you look at this photograph, uh, we will understand the way in which we can combine art, aesthetics, everything with photography. And uh, you no, know, these are best medium uh, for us to uh, communicate uh, science. And uh, happy uh, that uh, Umid is with us. And so I'm to honored. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm honored. I'm going to get straight into it. So I'll share my screen. Um, just tell me if everything is uh, visible. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yes. So it's it's clear. Yeah, it's clear. And you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as uh, Bijusa said, my name is Umid Mistri, and um, today I'm taking you through a little bit of my own journey, but also just an introduction to the world of underwater photography and some of the things that are happening uh, in, in India and outside India, both uh, in the realm of, you know, uh, just uh, uh, educational uh, and the kind of photography that I do, but then also into uh, some of the other very beautiful and eye-opening uh, image making that a lot of institutions internationally are, uh, you know, also uh, working on. Uh, very quickly, um, uh, as uh, Sir, Sir mentioned, I've, uh, I'm a dive instructor. I've been diving for uh, more than two decades now. It's something that I love more than anything else in the world. I am happiest when I'm underwater with my camera. Uh, I also have a great fascination for all wildlife in general. I've spent a lot of time uh, exploring coastal and intertidal habitats, but also forests and this, that and the other. And I'm very fortunate to work with a team of amazing uh, people who are uh, biophiles like me. We have a passion and an interest for uh, all things nature related. And uh, one of the things we've always tried to do is to try and bring an interdisciplinary approach to our own understanding, but also the way that we then choose to disseminate uh, information. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot of is taking people to the coast, taking people into the water, doing some diving and snorkeling and uh, that kind of thing with them. Because when you get somebody out into the environment, then it uh, you know makes a, a much big, bigger impact and difference than, for example, this kind of interaction where I'm with you on a screen. So I hope that after this uh, talk, um, some of you will reach out and come out with me and, uh, uh, you know, I'd be happy to help any of you that choose to take this, um, um, uh, sorry, this, this activity of underwater photography uh, forward. So moving straight into um, <clears throat> the... As, as part of my work, I've had the opportunity to travel to some extremely beautiful places uh, and I have a great affinity for coastlines and uh, as you may 
you know yourself have observed just even within the country of india but then if you expand that expand that to the world if you go from the equator up towards the poles uh, the kind of coastlines and uh, marine habitats that you encounter end up being extremely different and uh, it's uh, for me uh, this exploration of uh, you know more temperate uh, um, water uh, in uh, habitats has happened more in the last uh, I would say eight years uh, in, in a career of 25 years of uh, diving. Uh, so these are just a few examples of, uh, you know, different uh, uh, ways that the ocean might look in different parts of uh, uh, the world. And, uh, but the rest of the uh, talk that I'm uh, going to be giving you is um, uh, with, with images that are based, 90% of them have been taken in the Indian subcontinent so I, uh, and, and in the Indian Ocean. So between India, Lakshadweep, Andamans and Maldives. Uh, so I want you to keep that in mind because that should tell you some of the things that are available in our own backyards and uh, which, which is something that I give a great deal of uh, importance to. So obviously as a biophile and uh, somebody who, you know, uh, tended to look a lot towards nature for inspiration and uh, things like that, uh, in the beginning, I, you know, it, it was uh, a lot of pretty pictures and generally trying to keep, uh, you know, human beings outside of uh, um, my images. And this is a progression I have really recognized with a lot of uh, wildlife photographers that uh, initially we, uh, you know, want to look at all the pretty things. We want to look at all the inspirational things and we, uh, we tend to leave the human aspect Aspect out. But uh, as I've worked more and more in the field, as I've worked more and more in conservation and education and with a lot of researchers, uh, it becomes undeniable that human beings have shaped the, the uh, marine world and uh, they also have their own uh, justifiably important stories uh, to tell. And so I think uh, it became apparent to me that um, uh, you know, if uh, I want to tell the kind of stories that are not are, are less biased or less focused um, uh, more narrowly on just the beautiful and pretty pictures, then I'm going, going to have to point my lens at, uh, you know, other things and, and start to look at other, uh, you know, considerations that impact these habitats that I have uh, come to love so much. Uh, so I expanded, uh, you know, my own uh, gaze, my own understanding. I started doing a lot of um, freshwater photography and videography in uh, you know south india so that's uh, masir uh, on the right hand side of the screen and uh, so i'm going to take you on a little journey using my own images but also uh, i want to go beyond my own images and start to show you um, you know things that are happening in the world of underwater photography um, uh, both in india and outside and with the with our focus more towards uh, you know research and those kind of things so very quickly, uh, for those of you who know uh, Kerala and the coastline of Kerala, just in that state itself, the biodiversity of habitats that we end up having can be quite significant if you choose to actually make your way out there and start observing the differences. Uh, and uh, so if you then expand that, expand that to India and her islands, so India and the Lakshadweep and the Andamans, then I can assure you that uh, you can spend a lifetime just looking at those habitats and they will uh, you know completely blow your mind in terms of the diversity of everything from uh, flora and fauna to shapes and colors and textures and behaviors and interactions and uh, you know all of that and uh, so uh, in india we've got you know everybody is very familiar with the coral reefs these are images from the lakshadweep and the andamans <clears throat> and um, uh, sorry, I'm just going to change this view. Uh, right. Yeah. So these are images from the Lakshadweep and the Andamans. And uh, yeah. Then, uh, and, and all of you probably already know quite a bit about uh, uh, coral reefs. We've also got... Um, a lot of artificial reefs that have started to come up. Some of them are old uh, shipwrecks and uh, things like that, that uh, have been there for a while and have happened not intentionally to create an artificial reef, but then there are a lot of projects underway right now in Goa, Pondicherry, Andamans, uh, uh, some parts of Tamil Nadu also, where uh, we are going out and actually, uh, whether it's divers 
or whether it's uh, organizations that are doing a little bit more in terms of uh, water sports and therefore want to bring in, uh, you know, an element of uh, local uh, uh, community involvement and, uh, uh, you know, uh, conservation and things like that, uh, where uh, people are putting down artificial structures. Now, this is something that uh, fishermen and their fathers and their grandfathers have done for generations. And uh, so from a fishing perspective, it's something that's been happening for a while. For example, off the coast of Tamil Nadu, they put down tree barks and they put down big pipes, construction pipes and things like that. So that uh, this offers a refuge to creatures that live uh, uh, that uh, otherwise wouldn't inhabit that uh, sandy, flat kind of uh, habitat. And like that, they've grown these ecosystems which benefit their fishing. But now with diving and with cameras, we're able to go underwater and, and we're actually able to, um, you know, uh, um, uh, see what some of those uh, impacts are. And, and many of them are extremely positive because they uh, provide livelihoods uh, for fishermen on a small scale. They also provide areas for divers uh, then to be able to, you know, kind of engage and interact with creatures that wouldn't otherwise come to these uh, habitats. So those are some of the artificial reef uh, uh, things we've got. India has extensive mangrove systems. These are very, very important uh, ecosystems. They uh, work as nurseries, uh, you know, uh, for juvenile fish. And uh, there's always this saying that if you have an, a healthy mangrove system off, uh, on your coast, then the chances are that your offshore reefs are going to also be healthy. And there's that uh, correlation for reasons that I'm sure all of you are already aware of. Uh, we have a lot of seagrass meadows where there's not much by way of large structures like tree, mangrove tree roots or uh, large coral reef, uh, you know, um, or coral outcrops. But uh, uh, the grass binds the sand and, uh, you know, there are other strategies and a lot of the creatures that live there have evolved all these other strategies of um, uh, survival in a habitat that's very, very different from the ones that we see very often on National Geographic, which is usually the coral reef habitats and things like that, you know. Uh, so <clears throat> we have beautiful seagrass meadows and then we have other amazing habitats of, uh, sorry, uh, amazing adaptations of creatures that have chosen to inhabit uh, the vast sand flats and uh, on that, that India has along her continental shelf in areas where there are no reefs or no rocky outcrops. So as a very broad kind of separation, you know, there are all, there is this level of uh, biodiversity and then within these habitats, there's, there are micro habitats. And then within those micro habitats, there are creatures that have, you know, evolved over time to be sometimes extremely specific in uh, both their symbiosis with other creatures, but also then the places in which they're able to, um, uh, you know, reside. And of course, then uh, we've got our rocky intertidal zones. We've got our vast, uh, beautiful beaches. Kerala is famous for some of them. We've got turtle nesting sites. We've got, uh, you know, uh, 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 rocky intertidal uh, tide pools where uh, in, now even in places like Bombay and things like that, they're starting to, uh, you know, find uh, very, very cool biodiversity right in the heart of Bombay uh, in these tide pools. And uh, so when you think about all of these habitats, uh, yes, some of them might be a little bit uh, more difficult to access for some of you, but definitely some of them are available to you and you can definitely start your journey and your interest in, uh, you know, intertidal uh, and uh, even half in half out uh, photography and that kind of thing. Uh, very close to where uh, you are based. And Kerala's coastline is beautiful. And uh, I actually am, I would love to have more time and opportunity to spend, uh, you know, over there. So uh, as, a, as somebody who uh, started with this passion for diving and then picked up a camera because I was, I was diving as a dive instructor in the Lakshadweep in uh, 2002, 3, 4, 5, th those years. And at that time, very few people understood why is this guy going and, uh, you know, sitting for nine months out on an island? What is there to see? What is, uh, you know, keeping him occupied and things like that? And so I then picked up a camera. I started shooting mostly just to show friends and family. Then I decided I wanted to maybe write an article. So I wrote an, uh, my first article in uh, 2007. And I so I added writing as another way of uh, you know, disseminating information and, and trying to show and, and get people to understand. And so like this, 
I slowly started to uh, expand on the way that I wanted to uh, uh, involve other people in what I was doing when they themselves did not dive. Uh, but then in that process, it automatically became necessary for me to expand my own awareness. Now, obviously, even as a dive instructor, I'm underwater, I'm taking people to a new habitat that they've not been to. And so it's upon me and I, I took a great pleasure in seeing something which I didn't know what it was, I came, I would come back. At that time, there was no Google uh, accessibility, this, that, and the other. I was on an island with, uh, you know, no network. So I would just look through some of the uh, reef guides that uh, were there, some of the old books that were there, and slowly increased my own understanding of uh, the creatures that I was seeing and, uh, you know, uh, um, photographing. But now, you also have other opportunities, other ways. Uh, so much, this 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 uh, uh, explosive uh, amount of information that is available to us at our fingertips, and that's with Google, with YouTube, with social media, and things like that. And so this thing of people also just having a smartphone in their hands, everybody having access to at the very least the camera on their smartphone has actually created uh, an amazing wealth of information. And I'm going to show you how that has built up, uh, you know, a little bit over time. So um, I just move straight away into the slide. So in 2014, I was asked by two uh, researchers to do a, a survey of a seahorse in the Park Bay. And uh, they were primarily interested in knowing what the seahorse populations were like. And uh, because at that time, the government was looking at lifting the ban on uh, the collection of seahorse. But because I also was a photographer and I had my camera with me, they said that when you are not looking for a seahorse, you just shoot as many uh, you know, of the different creatures that you're able to uh, find. And so prior to that, now this was in 2014. And so I had been diving for almost 20 years, 18 years before that already. And uh, prior to that, I'd never even thought to go to the coast of Tamil Nadu and dive in these seagrass meadows. It's all quite shallow between uh, Park Bay and Sri Lanka. You're, uh, you know, looking at an average depth of six, eight meters, uh, maybe you know, uh, at most. And uh, so it's all very, very shallow, sometimes quite murky. And so when I initially went down the notion of what am I going to see over here, I didn't really know. But I cannot tell you that uh, I did 16 dives over four days. And on those 16 dives, I found a wealth of biodiversity that just blew my mind. And the camera allowed me to bring all of that back. And now that archive of information is sitting with these two researchers for any time that they uh, you know, decide that they want to use it. And while I was doing that, I was also uh, looking specifically for seahorse and uh, uh, pipefish and trying to count uh, you know, how many I could find. But just as an example of how something like the simple act of photography on a dive uh, can uh, uh, you know be informative is if this if you look at this photo on the top left of these two tiger shrimp, um, there was a long time where uh, uh, so so uh, biodiversity wise we got our hotspot of biodiversity towards the east and so you have your golden triangle between Philippines northwestern Australia uh, you know eastern um, uh, Indonesia that is the golden triangle of and, and biodiversity hotspot in this part of the world as all of you probably know so the more west that you come from there your biodiversity sort of tapers off but one of the things that cameras are starting to allow us to do and this you see on the east coast and in uh, the Andamans is that as more and more people are going out and more and more people are taking macro photos we are starting to see species that for a long time were thought to be only in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. So there are certain kinds of shrimps, certain kinds of eels. And over time, we might it might be photographers that who also then uh, start to uh, notice these movements before, let's say, somebody who needs to actually physically collect a sample of something to, to verify. So photography quite often is the, is the first you know, foray into asking uh, a question while also giving uh, a whole number of different answers. So all of these photos were taken in um, the Park Bay over four days. And I, I mean, I have many, many more, but this is just a selection of the, uh, you know, 
amazing diversity that I came across. And then this question, and I brought it to the attention of the researcher that, uh, you know, this is the first time that I'm seeing tiger shrimp in Indian waters, including the Andaman Islands. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was interesting to see that this shrimp not only existed in Indonesia and uh, Philippines and those places where we know that the biodiversity is high, uh, but they are also, uh, you know, uh, coming towards uh, Indian waters. Um, in 2017, then I had the opportunity to go back to the Park Bay, and, but this time uh, I was working with a different group of researchers, more social scientists, and they were working with the fishing communities. And so I had the opportunity to look at this place now from a completely different lens. So earlier it was a very, uh, uh, you know, a flora and fauna specific lens, but here it was more of a livelihood, uh, you know, fishing uh, uh, collection and uh, interaction between human beings and the ecosystem sort of lens. And so here again, uh, photography was a tool that allowed me to document some things which so far had only been verbal storytelling uh, uh, and, and had, had kind of been transmitted from one person to the next, uh, mostly through, uh, you know, uh, a language and, and the spoken word or the written word. And so uh, a picture, as, as they say, paints a thousand words. And so, so I, I, I don't even have to get into necessarily descriptions of these photos uh, for you to see already so many of the things that are happening in them. I'm particularly fond of these half in half out photographs like the one of the crab fishermen over here, because in one photograph, it allows you to see two worlds and it allows you to see the connections. It allows you see, to see the differences, uh, you know, et cetera. So uh, these were all taken off of, uh, sorry, go back, back, back. Yeah, these were all taken off of the uh, Gulf of Manar and Park Bay, both, both uh, parts. So moving from, you know, one's own expanding awareness and then including stakeholders, including other people, other photographers or other scientists' works, which you then start to Venn diagram into your own areas of uh, interest, one of the things that I found invaluable of late is has been the um, the ability for us to share and communicate information through uh, something like WhatsApp, where with a very cheap phone uh, and the app, you can you know be sending images, you can be sending videos. So I have had the opportunity to photograph whales. Uh, very often, uh, cetacean studies are done by photographing uh, whales on the surface and observing uh, patterns in their tails and their fins and this, that and the other. I've also had the good fortune of being able to be underwater with, uh, uh, you know, some of these creatures. But one of the things that's happening recently, which I find really quite uh, beautiful, is that it's the fisherman network that, so my uh, our colleague that uh, uh, Biju sir mentioned, Dipani, she studies cetaceans and she has developed a system where she has gone out and she's got this network of fishermen together and they keep sending her photos of uh, dolphins, photos of whales, photos of beached uh, cetaceans, photos of dead cetaceans out at sea, photos of cetaceans trapped in fishing gear. And uh, so these are people who spend day in and day out, hours, days, weeks, months at a time sometimes out at sea. And they are going to get and see things which you and I are never going to actually be able to see unless we go and spend the same amount of time. And so this fact of just having this simple camera, uh, you know, on your phone is something that has now exploded the wealth of information that we are starting to uh, receive. And Dipani and some of her colleagues have become so good at identifying some of these creatures just by seeing the, uh, you know, sp whale spout or the fluke or the uh, tail or, you know, uh, certain behaviors. And they are starting to, their own awareness is growing because they're like, oh, we know now that this kind of behavior happens over here, or we see mating behavior happening off the coast of Bombay, or this whale ended up uh, beached, uh, you know, on this coastline, and she gets photos from them. So, like this, uh, um, it's it's the connectivity of obviously telecommunication, but many of these things cannot happen without the image. And so photography is playing a role, even if it might not be something so tangible to us, uh, uh, you know, unless we actually are paying attention to that. Um, is, right. So, but then you go one step further. Now we, you and I are probably able to see whales uh, mostly on the surface, 
you know, we might see uh, the tail or the spout or whatever when they're exhaling. But then you have organizations now uh, that are starting to share on social media. These are videos on YouTube. I will show you in the next couple of slides some of the organizations that I follow on Instagram where the kind of deep water uh, photography, deep water imaging that they're doing is so amazing. Uh, it's, it's opening up our eyes to the world uh, down where no light reaches and the cliche of the fact that, you know, we know more about space than the bottom of our own oceans. And so these organizations, by sending cameras down there, are uh, starting to bring this world back up to us and making what is inaccessible to 99.999% of the world's population will never see this by in situ. So, so, but, but social media and YouTube and these kind of, uh, and Google, they're now making this information accessible. And again, you have to recognize the importance of imagery uh, uh, over here. So now by seeing this, I have also then been able to make a connection that, okay, this is what these creatures look like. This is how they behave. They have come up to breed. So they have to be on the surface, blah, blah, blah. But then I start to make a connection that, oh, when they die, then this is something that starts to happen to them. And it's something that I will never see, but now I know that when a whale dies and sinks to the bottom, it actually creates a micro ecosystem for sometimes as long as a year, uh, you know, or a year and some months, depending on the size of the whale, where it attracts all sorts of creatures that come to it and feed on it for that duration of time till it disintegrates uh, entirely. And uh, this is really, fascinating, fascinating stuff. And it all comes to us with imagery or through imagery. Uh, so just very quickly for those of you who are interested, this is one of the uh, accounts that I follow on Instagram and I find their uh, uh, you know, content really fascinating and beautiful. It's uh, NOAA Ocean Exploration and the Ambari News um, uh, Instagram site is also something that I find uh, you know, very, very exciting to look at because it's all deep water stuff, which uh, me as a diver with the kind of equipment that I use for as many dives as I may have done, I, I have not even, uh, you know, reached uh, a fraction of the ocean depths. And then here you have these uh, machines and these people being sent down in submersibles to thousands and thousands of meters to bring back this information to us. Now, again, another offshoot of social media and uh, then therefore also, uh, the photos that you take and put up on social media uh, are that they start to create these online databases. And one of the most uh, important ones in the marine world that I've come across and had uh, some overlap with also in my work and things like that is this organization called Manta Trust. Now, I don't know if, I mean, I'm sure many of you know that mantas are identifiable by the spots on their lower sides. And so if you have a photograph of the underneath of a manta ray where you see clearly the spots on its underside, you can actually upload it to Manta Trust and they will either already have a record of that creature or if they don't have a record of that creature, they add your photo to their database. Now, what this is doing is that it's uh, giving you uh, an understanding of, uh, you know, these creatures and uh, it's giving you a size estimate, estimates, population estimates, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But one step further is that it's giving you information about, oh, this Manta Ray went from the Maldives all the way to Indonesia because it was photographed there. And then it went to Northern Australia because it was photographed there. And then it came back to the Andamans because it was photographed there. So that connectivity is also starting to happen. Some of these online databases are becoming very, very expansive uh, on, in, on land. And in India, for example, we have eBird and all of these ones, which are very common. And so like that for the marine uh, space as well, you're starting to get some of these um, uh, online databases. So these are two that I follow also on uh, Instagram for those of you who are interested. And, and uh, at the very least, what you're doing when you collect photographs is that you are documenting biodiversity. You may get a sense of uh, populations, um, you may not, but you're, you're definitely documenting biodiversity. And uh, now to you as students of uh, you know, marine uh, sciences in the University of Kerala, this might not seem like such a great thing, but I want you to step away from your own immediate and identities for a moment and think that 
uh, what you consider normal or, or based because of the educations that you have are sometimes very, very new for your neighbor, for example, or your grandparents, or, uh, you know, the, the, the friend living down the road who has never stepped into the ocean. And so by this medium of photography, you are actually expanding other people's worlds. You are expanding the information that we have about the biodiversity in India. Uh, sometimes I've been contacted on occasion for a photograph where a scientist has got in touch with me and said, hey, I saw this photo of a Blenny. Uh, you know, it. Uh, we don't think that it's been documented from India. So can you tell me where you saw it? And uh, do you know what species and what habitat it was in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, at the very least, there is a, a biodiversity uh, documentation component that is constantly then happening. And with the ability now to share the way that uh, the, the telecommunication and social media allows us, that is something that you know is a very valuable um, end result. And so I don't know if any of if you guys have heard of Marine Life of Mumbai, but please check their Instagram out. It's it, the, the things that they are introducing to the citizens of Bombay, who up until I would say five years back didn't even realize that there was this world uh, in their own, you know, just in the areas where they would all sit and watch the sunset uh, on the breech candy, uh, you know, uh, uh, edge of the ocean or whatever. If they just took another 50 meters worth of steps into the ocean, they would see all of this amazing stuff. Now, <clears throat> the ability to shoot uh, underwater obviously requires a couple of different things. And uh, so there's the, and, and, you know, when people think about underwater photography or diving, they immediately think one of the hindrances, especially in the Indian context, is that, oh, it's either very expensive or it's very complicated. But I want to break that uh, uh, notion, um, you know, a little bit because, yes, it is a little bit more expensive. And depending on the complexity of what you choose to document, it can be extremely complicated. But you don't have to start with complication. You can start quite simply. And um, now technology has allowed us to shoot in multiple different ways. It has allowed us to uh, you know, see things at a very micro scale. It's allowed us to see aerial bird's eye views of entire island chains and you know, whales and orcas hunting from the surface and things like that with drones that we're starting to do right now. And diving technology is allowing us to go to places which were earlier not accessible at all. So the basic, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, system of breathing air was is, is what most of us uh, might be able to learn as a certification in a dive center. But there are layers of complexity to that as well that then allow you to go into more extreme parts of the ocean. Coming back to the technology of cameras, if you were to start there, as you all know now, even your phone cameras are starting to take beautiful photos and videos. And there are housings now that are being made. Purple Octopus in Bombay, they sell a housing for your phone camera. It's a foam housing. It fits any camera. It allows you to punch your, uh, you know, access uh, certain aspects of your uh, uh, functions from outside the camera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And people, some of my dive instructor friends are starting to shoot beautiful video and images from the Andamans just using their phones. You want to go a little bit more, you've got your uh, GoPros and your, uh, you know, these other uh, cylindrical cameras, I forget the name right now, you've got your uh, TG6 cameras, which are already waterproof like this, they don't need an external housing, at least to 10 meters, if you want to take them beyond 10 meters, then they need an external housing. And then of course, you've got your higher end cameras that require, uh, you know, higher end housings. But for an example of what you can do with your phone and some of the accessories that are available for your phone, uh, these are the kind of you know images that uh, I've pulled off the internet that people have shot with their phones. Um, this is now what's starting to happen with accessories for the GoPro, which earlier was you know such a simple camera, but now you're getting red filters, you're getting lights, you're getting trays, you're getting domes that allow you to do those half in half out shots where you get that clean line, uh, you know, uh, uh, both above and below the water. And so these are quite inexpensive when you think about a what you're able to achieve and what you're able to uh, be able to photograph 
uh, which you wouldn't be have access to if you didn't have this basic equipment. And you don't have to immediately be investing in all the high end stuff that is exorbitantly expensive if, if that's not your main uh, focus. Then of course you have your point and shoot cameras, like I already said, the TG6, but each one has you know, a whole host of various accessories that can also be added to further uh, push the outputs of these cameras. And then you have systems like this. This is similar to what a professional uh, would use. This is very similar to uh, some of the gear that I use. And uh, uh, this is then taking the end product to a much higher quality where let's say I want to broadcast on Netflix or uh, you know things like that. But that's not necessarily the place that any of you need to start in and it may not even be the necessary end goal. This, this is quite, sometimes quite over the top for uh, what we're uh, for a for a research or scientific uh, purpose, uh, irrespective of what camera setup you choose, uh, generally photographers are shooting you know wide angle shots like the one with the turtle, uh, mid mid range shots uh, you know like uh, this one over here or macro and super macro shots where I've got two skeleton shrimp over here on the right hand side uh, that are uh, feeding on a uh, keto gnath. Um, and, and all of that is happening in the size of a one rupee coin. And I've shot it with a macro lens stacked with another, uh, you know, super macro adapter on it. Um, so this is the kind of uh, results that you're able to get, not only with the fancy big cameras that I showed you, but even with the TG point and shoot cameras that are starting to come out now, they, some of them are starting to do an excellent job. And, uh, you know, so, so for a uh, much more moderate price than let's say five or 10 years ago, you can be executing photos like this as well. Then of course you have accessories of lights that allow us to you know, shoot at night. They allow us to shoot uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, biofluorescence uh, shots. They allow us to bring light into areas underwater, which otherwise would be quite dark. And as you all know, there's a refraction of light that happens and the red uh, wavelengths of light uh, tend to dissipate first. And so the moment you go past five or six meters, things start to become more and more and more and more blue. And so if you want to see the true colors of things, then you need to use lights underwater. And uh, so these are, I've shot this image with strobes attached uh, to my um, housing. Now, if you go from cameras, uh, uh, now I'm, I'm talking about ocean photography in general. And so because ocean spaces are often inaccessible, uh, you can't, let's say you see something uh, 500 meters away, but you can't walk up to it the way that you would be able to on land. Uh, with drones now, we're starting to be able to do some amazing photography. And I'm not going to get too much into it because I've only just started shooting uh, drone uh, stuff quite recently, maybe over the last one year or so. But there are some people, uh, especially for cetacean behavior, if you uh, go to Instagram and you do hashtag drone, hashtag whale, and you just search for uh, posts that combine those two hashtags, the behavior that we're starting to observe now with drones uh, of cetaceans is just outstanding. And uh, the visuals are things that, that prior to two years ago, Many of us would not even, we might have been able to imagine them, but they would, we would never have access to them because they just weren't there. That, 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 that stock of imagery was just not there. Uh, then of course, you know, you start to go into much, much more uh, institutionally, uh, you know, required budgets, but then also equipment that comes with it. And so you've got your submersibles and you've got your ROVs that are taking people down to places where divers like myself are just not able to go. And again, cameras end up playing a huge role in our understanding of these ecosystems. Yes, there's a lot of sample collection that happens. There's a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes that you have uh, people actually going down, not in the ROVs, but in the submersibles where they're actually making in-situ ob observations. But uh, a lot of data is being collected sometimes on a 24 hourly basis with the help of non-human unmanned uh, vehicles and cameras being sent to different parts of the ocean. Now, coming back to uh, a more realistic framework for all of us as beginners of underwater photography, let's say, uh, diving does play a role if you decide that you want to submerse yourself into the underwater realm. If you want to start 
you don't have to, many many people ask me do i need to be a diver to start underwater photography i say no you can do half in half out photography you can do shallow water photography you can do photography with mask fins and snorkel you can do riverine and uh, lake photography in india without being a diver but the moment you want to start pushing that and you want to start being able to spend more time and therefore by by spending more time being able to observe certain behaviors that uh, wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to do if you were for example holding a breath then scuba starts to become important now on the right hand side over here where you see the two moray eels and the diver observing the moray eels he's got the standard single tank on the back and he's got a harness and he's got a regulator that's bringing air from his tank to his a uh, mouth that he's breathing from and this is the basic scuba equipment that if any of you chose to do an open water course in india uh, you would be taught how to use that equipment thereby allowing you then to go down with a gopro or any other larger camera that you might choose but what happens then when you want to let's say go deeper or you want to then let's say stay longer now biju sir mentioned that i have uh, met him because of this hydrophone project that's been happening in uh, off the coast of uh, kerala and uh, so my friend yona who is seen in the left hand side two pictures uh, and i we do this dive where we go down the bottoms almost 40 meters deep and so if i was going on a single tank of air to 40 meters i am allowed to stay only for 5 minutes before i then start to accrue too much nitrogen where i cannot come straight up to the surface so now we have more than 5 minutes worth of work on the water and so we need to start taking multiple tanks down we need to ha start having multiple backups of our dive computers and things like that because what's happening to us is that we are spending a longer time at 40 meters and so as we are coming up we have to do mandatory decompression stops before we break the surface so very often we end up doing a 70 to 75 meter a minute dive for this uh, hydrophone project and um that ends up being uh, uh, about 20 minutes spent at the bottom so including the time to go down spend 20 minutes at the bottom and the rest of the time about 40 minutes time is often spent uh, you know just decompressing as we are coming up towards the uh, back up to the, towards the boat so this is a more technical form of diving now the complexity of this can be from just using two cylinders for example to then this kind of uh you know a uh, uh, a rig that you end up seeing where people are spending extraordinarily long times underwater or ex going extraordinarily deep or going into caves where they cannot emerge from the caves uh you know for a long amount of time etc now again all of these photos i've just pulled off of the internet for the moment and you might think oh but you know you know he's talking to us about things that are not accessible for us in india well this is a friend of mine who trains uh, people out of pondicherry and he and i do this kind of diving uh, you know for uh, this research work and there are now uh, here sorry there here are some photos this is the hydrophone uh, that uh, you know we've just installed and uh, this is us coming back up from the line and on one of our decompression stops uh, yona has got three tanks two on this side and one on that side uh, i have uh, on this dive uh, two tanks if i'm not mistaken but this photograph over here on the top right has been taken off of pondicherry at 50 meters down where the temple adventures dive center is now uh, geared up they have the instructors they have the equipment they have the expertise to teach you this kind of diving so this sort of diving is now starting to become accessible in a recreational perspective uh, this is called technical diving it's not uh, it's not single tank recreational diving but even within the realm of technical diving what are you doing it for are you doing it recreationally are you doing it to explore a shipwreck or a cave are you doing it the way for example i do it where i'm helping my researcher friend dipani to put a hydrophone down or i'm going taking my camera down deeper and longer to be able to start to document reefs that so far have not been documented so this is all stuff that is available to all of you um now as uh, you know with with good instructors with good certifying agencies with good sort of uh, protocols uh, being uh, you know followed by divers that are trustworthy and have spent their own hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of time 
uh, practicing and getting up to the mark where they are qualified to train you. Now, that is just... shoot. But there's also other things that are happening with photography, and I'm going to touch very briefly on them. In the left two slides, uh, you have what is called a setup, a very, very simple PVC pipe setup of what is called a photo quadrat. And all of you might already be familiar with this system of, uh, you know, uh, taking a photograph of a quadrat to then analyze, uh, you know, any, any number of different kinds of information that you might want to but if you leave a base, a frame in one place and you start to take the same photograph over, let's say, uh, months of time, then you start to also see that within that photo quadrat, what some of the changes are. Uh, so, so, so there are people who are doing this kind of photography on that scale. Then you can start to take kind of zoom out of this. And there are people who are now doing photography and using a combination of photography and some very advanced softwares to... Um, kind of map out, you know, horizontally, then from the top, then from the other side and do these three dimensional maps of reefs and artificial reefs and shipwrecks. And so this is where you're starting to have a combination of the technology of image making uh, where it's not such a complicated process for the photographer, but then you have amazing softwares that are being plugged into this process to then create an output which uh, no one person with one camera on a single day is going to be able to achieve. So that's what's, you know, some, some of what's possible uh, in that realm. But then you also have this other, uh, you know, like the camera on the right, for example, is a camera that um, uh, is deployed by the U University of California in Santa Barbara. And it's a camera which when it, it, it goes all the way to the bottom and the moment it touches the bottom, it senses the bottom and it's weighted in such a way that the camera faces the bottom. It's got a very, very narrow, uh, you know, uh, focal length, small focal length, and it's got its uh, uh, lights and, uh, you know, LEDs and all of that. And it photographs the substrate. And then you've got a software that can look at that photograph and individually kind of actually almost literally count out your particles of sand, all the other things that are, you know, visible in that photograph. And so, there's that kind of, um, you know, uh, a kind of melding of technology and software. Uh, so similarly, Dipani, what she's doing with this hydrophone over here, the, the metal structure that you see that we put down over there, is that she's using software uh, to uh, scrub through it and to identify where the hydrophone has picked up sounds of cetaceans that have passed by. So sound is something that one is already uh, we're using sonar already. And so imaging, we often think of imaging as something that happens only with light, but we're starting to combine imaging, I mean, technology and software to be able to create images of deep water topography, for example, using sonar and using sound waves. And this then comes to us as a image based readout. Um, which is then very, very useful because for us, it, it makes sense, you know, sp spatially and things like that. Uh, there are other softwares. There's a new one that's been developed, I think, about four years ago, where this researcher uh, sat down with a bunch of techies and they came up with a software which is able to remove the blue hue of your uh, underwater photographs, restore all the colors to what they would look like if that refraction was not happening, so that to further enhance the detail of what might be happening in a photograph for researchers who are studying coral to be able to, for example, look at some of the smaller growths and health of some of the smaller growths based on color, uh, you know, uh, that are in the sand over here around this uh, big head of coral that you see in the middle. So this combination of technologies, whether it's, um, you know, imaging and software or sound and software or, uh, you know, software being used to create three-dimensional, uh, uh, you know, images and uh, now 360 uh, VR and all of that is also coming into play. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of that that's also happening. And so photography is something that, you know, you have to decide uh, what you want to make of it. And everybody 
quite often I get this comment from people, oh, you take such amazing photos, you must have an amazing camera. I do at the moment have an amazing camera, yes. But it's not that I started out straight away with an amazing camera. And so the camera is simply a tool. And if you take the camera and you apply your intelligence and your know-how and your creativity to it, then photography becomes something that, uh, you know, you make of it. Now, as you all already know, India, look at our coastline. This is our coastline. It's incredible. It's immense. We've got beautiful island chains and we've got extensive, extensive uh, and multitudinous habitats. We want to make sense of this space for ourselves, but then also be able to translate that and ripple effect that to people who might never travel to the coastline or don't have the opportunity, or for that matter, even fishing communities who live on the coastline but have never put a mask on and looked underwater to, 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 to visually recognize what is happening underwater, then photography becomes a tool uh, that can add great value to us making sense of this amazing, amazing uh, ocean heritage that we have. And so there are, uh, you know, documentations of processes. So for example, the photo on the right, as you all know, is a coral where the, uh, you know, Zuzanthale has been expunged from the coral, but the polyps are still alive. So talking about, so, you know, some of the nuances of bleaching to people who think that bleaching just means everything turns white and dies. And whereas, you know, the, 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 the nuances of some of those processes or looking at, uh, you know, uh, different practices of extraction and which ones are sustainable and which ones are not so sustainable. And, uh, you know, what some of the offshoots of those things uh, can uh, be. And then, then uh, you know, taking some of these images back to the communities themselves that are engaging in these practices. Some, and, and I want to be very clear over here that it's not from a perspective of judgment. It's, it's when, I, when I go out to these places, I am never ever taking the stance of telling people you should not be doing this. No, I go out there, I shoot what I see, I, I, I shoot it as I see it. And then for those of them who are interested to engage with me and uh, the, the social scientists that I you know, end up working with, uh, it, it, it begins a dialogue. And so a photograph often is a starting point of a dialogue. And uh, that then has uh, the possibility to cascade into so many different uh, things. So, you know, not just the pretty pictures, veering away from the pretty pictures sometimes, pointing our lenses at the realities of some of our, uh, uh, you know, marine systems and the state that they're in. Using photography to uh, document behavior. So for example, the parrotfish and the, uh, you know, little mucus uh, balloon that it's created, mucus blanket that it's created for itself, uh, uh, you know, at night to sleep in. Um, and, and so this, ha this is a very common process that happens in the Andamans and the Lakshadweep, uh, uh, you know, at night when you go out and you look at the reef at night and you see sleeping parrotfish. So bringing this uh, information back to people who've never not done a night dive or, uh, you know, maybe a, 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 a student of marine biology might know that from reading the text in their book that this is something that parrotfish do, but by showing them this photograph, they are able to see what it actually ends up looking like. Photographing plankton and, and microscopic things that, uh, you know, you and I will never actually necessarily see with our naked eye underwater, and then photographing the creatures that rely on that plankton and the entire, uh, you know, scale of things that happens in between, right from the minuscule all the way up to the uh, uh, magnificent, you know, so, so photography is something that has uh, so many different applications to it that uh, it's, it's you, uh, the person behind the camera, based on their own affinities, based on their own, uh, you know, interests that has to decide what do I want to do with this. And so as youngsters who are now, you know, coming into a world where uh, people are bombarding you with, oh, there's climate change, there's ocean acidification, there's sea level rise, there's degradation, environmental degradation and pollution and this, that and the other. I'm sure that many of you, you know, have started to ask yourself some of these questions. I'm sure that many of you have started to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have these internal uh, dialogues with or monologues with yourself. Um, and, and so what I hope that this uh, uh, demonstration of photos 
and and uh, the, some of the stories that I've shared with you, what I hope that they do is that they encourage you to pick up a tool. The camera is a tool to pick up that tool and but but to apply your own uh, you know creativity and your own uh, perspective and your own individuality because that is what is going to uh, actually make the difference between uh, one person's photograph and another person's photograph. And right now, as you all know, there are photographs bombarding the world and the internet, a million, billions of them being created every day. But uh, you have the ability to tell your own story and the camera as a tool to, uh, to, um, to complement the words that you might use uh, is, is, is a very, very powerful tool. So I'm going to end it uh, over there. And uh, I think, I, I don't know if, uh, Biju sir, do you want to do, uh, I don't know if you want to do a question answer session. Yes, yes if you have time. I have time. I, yes. I don't know what so, the, yeah. the students have been at it for the last two days. So they're probably quite, uh, also quite tired. Yeah, I think. Just, uh, what we can do is we'll just ask them to come to the stage in the, in the room where they are and then ask questions. Uh, Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then um, uh, may I start with my questions? Of course, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One question is that you, know, the, the, you have shown a tiger shrimp and uh, actually, uh, where was it from? It was from uh, Andamans? No, this was in the Park Bay. Oh, it was in the Park Bay. It's a yeah. very interesting thing. And then, it's, it, it, then uh, and second is actually a photograph of a sperm whale. A pair of sperm whales. And yes. Uh, is it from Indian waters or somewhere? That else? is between uh, the, the southern tip of India and the east of uh, Sri Lanka. Oh, ah, okay. Very, very. So it's uh, it's yeah. very. It was it was uh, not so far. Uh, it was off. I I shot it coming from the Sri Lankan side, but uh, as the crow flies not so far from the south of uh, Kanyakumari, and uh, uh, there they they are kind of they you know move up and down in, in uh, the southern and eastern part of Sri Lanka. And this was a pod of sperm whales that was going, they were very pointedly moving from west to east. And they were, uh, they were, they looked like that they were going from uh, down around the south of uh, Sri Lanka. And then from people who we spoke to over the phone a couple of days later, it looked like they had gone towards the eastern, uh, southeastern side of uh, Sri Lanka. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. And what uh, what is uh, the largest group uh, which you have seen in, in terms of baleen whales? Just for a curiosity, you know. Baleen you... whales, uh, I think, maybe of four. I think, but but not in India. Not uh, baleen whales. I've seen. I think four humpbacks, uh, humpback whales off the coast of uh, Iceland. And uh, they were uh, kind of, you know, seem to be traveling uh, uh, together. But uh, baleen whales off the coast of India, I've only seen uh, uh, blue whales solitary. I have not mm -hmm. seen uh, more than uh, a solitary blue whale. Uh, or um, mm, I've seen two sperm whales off of uh, Havelock. I've seen cuvier's uh, beaked whales off of uh, on the on the on the sailing from Port Blair to Narcondam. Um, and uh, in the Lakshadweep, I've seen uh, the fishermen said that it was a blue whale, but I couldn't tell. It was very, very far away. We were seeing the spout. Uh, the spout had a seven to eight minute interval, so it could have been a blue whale, uh, but uh, it was very, very far, very far away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So whales are something that, uh, I mean, I've been very lucky to have been able to see them, but I don't specifically pursue cetaceans the way that a lot of other either researchers or photographers do and that's why i said uh, you know if to, to see some really incredible uh, drone and other even underwater imagery uh, just uh, search on instagram with hashtag drone hashtag whale and some of the things that are coming up now you know we're starting to see like uh, these humpbacks where the, the the matriarch does the exhalation of the bubbles in a circle below the uh, fish school and the bubbles form a curtain and they come up like that in a cylindrical curtain and so they uh, they they urge all the uh, schooling fish to to go into the center and then all the other younger whales they come up in that uh, bubble corridor uh, with their mouths wide open you know and and now with a drone 
from above, the first thing that you see are this, this circle of bubbles that are starting to be uh, created. And then you see all these whale mouths coming up from the bottom. You know, so, so yes, researchers knew this was happening from, from maybe even 20, 25 years ago and they were observing these whales, but to actually visually be able to see it like that, just by the fact that there's now this small $500, you know, a little camera with a, <laughs> two, uh, propel, four propellers, I think it's mind blowing. It's, it's, I think it's amazing, you know? So, so that application also, I find very, very interesting for cetaceans, yeah. Yeah, before uh, the students uh, ask questions, one more thing, you know, the, the uh, there are a lot of uh, discussion on the health of the marine ecosystem as such in Indian waters. Right. Uh, and and uh, over the two decades, uh, you know, uh, underwater photography, what do you feel? Uh, whether there is a kind of uh, deterioration of the system or uh, in, in many parts, uh, this is not as such uh, what we perceive. See, sir, at large, there is deterioration of the system. Uh, I used to dive in the Lakshadweep. My first dives in the Lakshadweep were in 1996. And uh, <clears throat> uh, recently I was there in 20, uh, last, last year, I can't remember. Yeah, last year. And um, uh, 2021, sorry. And uh, the thing is that, for, so, so if I was to give you just a very simple kind of example, if I was to look only at the, the number of reef sharks, for example, that we were seeing on the dives. When I was a dive instructor in the Lakshadweep, on a, any given dive to one of the uh, more popular and more diverse sites, I would see anywhere between three to seven, eight reef sharks, white tip reef sharks, resting on the deeper uh, sand flat away from the reef. Now it's becoming extremely difficult to see them. Uh, you know, so now you're you're very getting very lucky if you see them. That uh, removal of sharks from the ecosystem, the reef sharks from the ecosystem in the Andamans happened even before that. Uh, you know, so Lakshadweep was still okay till 2005, 2006. But uh, of late, since they've started a lot of more of the reef fishing in the Lakshadweep, that has definitely declined. But then when you look at things like, for example, coral, um, I, uh, you know, I uh, is my screen sharing only the okay. Uh, if you look at coral, for example, then uh, uh, Lakshadweep, as you know, it's come and gone, come and gone, come and gone. There's been so much bleaching, but then uh, in some areas, amazing, amazing, uh, uh, you know, uh, rehabilitation that's happened, and uh, then again bleaching, and again rehabilitation, and then some of these bleaching events have started to happen more frequently. Um, and so then, even though the rehabilitation is happening, sometimes it doesn't have the time to happen to the degree that it happened in the previous cycle. And so then your reef size has now become, you know, smaller or more patchy, things like that. Um, there, there's definitely degradation at, a, at an overall scale. I'm not a scientist. I've not done the actual data collection to, you know, say that uh, about any specific species as such. But as a photographer and as somebody who's been visiting the Lakshadweep from 1996 till 2021, um, I can say for certain that uh, the, the number of fish, the uh, coral cover, the coral cover, when I was working there, I would say was some in, in, in some years, 80%, uh, you know, of amazing coral cover. Now it's the reverse. Now I say it's about 20, 25% on many of the dive sites that I used to go to every single day. And uh, I've had a chance to visit some of those dive sites recently, and it's down to about 20% uh, coral cover. In the Andamans, um, you go to a place like Barren Island, for example, after the 2016 uh, bleaching, uh, I think it was 2016, I can't, uh, um, uh, or maybe the one before, um, you go to Barren Island, and in the place where the volcano is erupting and the lava is coming down into the water, perhaps because of the higher mineral content and things like that, there's one patch of coral over there, which is growing just under and on the lava flow, the part of the lava flow that's come into the water. It is the healthiest coral I've seen in the Andamans. And uh, it is so healthy, so uh, vibrant, so thick. There's a combination in some parts of, uh, you know, uh, this cabbage uh, structured coral, I forget the name. And then there's also a little bit of Acropora uh, interspersed uh, amidst it. So, you know, there are these variabilities, but overall in terms of trash, 
there's an increase. In terms of uh, fishing, there's an increase. Uh, you know, so, so even just going to the dive sites, the number of fishing boats that I'm seeing around me, uh, the amount of nets that I'm noticing and, and cutting out uh, of reefs underwater, those things are definitely on the, on the rise. And um, overall coral uh, distribution is, is less. Yeah, you have uh, any, uh, came across any methane seep or areas uh, along any the- Any what, sir? Any, any meat, underwater methane seep or- No, 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 no. I have not. There are people who have said that uh, they have seen what they think was a, a methane seep and these warm water vents uh, coming out from Barren mm. um, <clears throat> on some of the others, uh, on some of the deeper slopes of Barren, but I have never actually experienced uh, that. Okay. So that place, for example, is one place where I really wish that, you know, the people would uh, be given the opportunity and people with the correct uh, the qualifications, obviously. So, you know, some of these organizations that have displayed an interest, but uh, I think the combination of logistics to get out there and spend time there and things like that, it's right now proven to be quite inhospitable. But uh, Barren Island and Narkondam Island, I feel, and some of the, uh, you know, islets off the Lakshadweep and things like that, I feel they are amazing places to look at uh, marine life uh, from a very kind of almost laboratory type perspective because they're so cut off, so isolated, you know. Yeah. Uh, but sadly, on my last uh, visit to Barren Island, not last, one of my visits to Barren Island, even there uh, on the... Uh, Western, no, sorry, not Barren Island, Narcondam Island. On the western side, uh, I was uh, in the water behind the boat and I was holding on to the boat and it was moving and I was just with my mask and I was just looking down and I saw these huge uh, shark nets, you know, so they put them long, kilometers long. And, mm -hmm. but, but uh, the boys had crumpled, the boys that were holding them up, they had crumpled. And so the net was still active. There, some of them was the boys had sunk to about twenty meters down. I, it was too deep for us to to dive, but the water was clear enough that I could see these lines of shark nets, you know. And they they obviously discarded, no longer actively being collected or harvested or fished, but uh, that's probably still collecting uh, marine life and doing you know damage because it's not uh, been removed. So so all of those those factors are definitely you know there. Um, and, and that degradation is definitely there. And that's why I feel all the more reason. See, India is always, a, 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 with uh, regards to adventure sports and accessibility to those things, we've always been one or two steps behind. Things come to India a little bit later. So we're only now coming to the kind of diving that allows us to you know, really go out and explore some of these places. And that's why I feel there's an urgency also for more photography and video documentation from these places before we end up losing those habitats entirely or, or before to, to establish some kind of at least baseline as to what those habitats look like uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to then start forming other questions and, and, and potential opportunities for study, I think.